Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to Wednesday night adult Bible study. Praise God. Everybody else in their classes and we're in our class. Amen. Amen. Good to have you here. Glory to God. Everybody having a good week? Yes. Amen. Glory to God. Linda, you still having a good week? Yes, I am. Amen. Glory. Amen. You want to testify about that? Yeah, come here. <laughs> Get up here where everybody can see you. <laughs> well, I'm not up here to really put on a show. I just want you to know I can stomp on my feet now. <laughs> and there's no pain. <laughs> um, I don't know if every, uh, everybody was here Sunday morning, but... I had been, um, I guess, bothered with neuropathy. I, I don't know really how to say it, but it's the nerve endings in your feet and in your legs. I haven't had it in my legs as bad as I've had it in my feet for probably several years. And that's how come I can't, you know, do all the cooking I used to like to do, standing on my feet a long time. But anyway, Saturday I'd spent a long time on my feet. Friday I had. And... I was really hurting real bad in my feet. And, and if you hadn't ever had that in your feet, the nerve, you, you, can't, you can't get relief from it that I know of unless I told my doctor he'd probably put me on another medicine. But uh, I, I would soak my feet in vinegar. I, I would rub my feet with lotions, and that would help a little bit. But I had been praying for a long time. I said, Lord, heal my feet. Heal my feet in Jesus' name. And um, I almost didn't come to church Sunday morning. Because when I woke now, up, I now thought... Now, Linda, what she, was, what she was doing Saturday was she was helping out at the funeral. And, you know, you, you ladies took food there, but she stayed there for hours. But, you know, Heather and I did, you know, yeah. Work, working on yeah. that. Yeah, we, we were there five hours at least mm -hmm, on my feet. But anyway, um, I thought, no, I'm going to go to church. I've gone to church lots of times when my feet hurt. And so the service was wonderful. And you, you, what, what you had preached that morning... I guess refreshed what I needed to, to release my faith. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was a good message on releasing your faith. And, and um, I had no idea God was going to tell Caleb to uh, come up and say, uh, if anyone is, the Lord is laid on my heart, or however he said it, he says to pray for someone to pray for those that might have neuropathy in their, in their feet, in their legs. I thought, oh my goodness, that's me? I mean, everybody's going to get tired of me coming up here on all my elements, but I, one by one, I'm coming up if the Lord calls me up. <laughs> so if there's other things that happen, there goes, there goes Linda Ray again. I'm not falling apart. I'm getting rid of all this stuff. <laughs> but anyway, so I thought, my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. So I'd already released my faith as I was coming up. I said, you know, I've been praying about this. And, yeah. and you know, and, and um, so it, Winona was up here. He, he prayed for I didn't even wait hardly for him to even lay his hands on me. I received it that quick. Uh, I told him tonight, I said, Caleb, I'm sorry I didn't even let you pray over me. I said, but... But I said, as soon as you went to lay your hands in Jesus' name, I said, the pain in my feet instantly left, and I knew I was healed. Yeah. And I've been healed, and I'm staying healed. <laughs> Amen. And that is a great, great healing for me, I want y'all to know. That is a great healing. Amen. Well, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, praise God, amen. Yeah, I've, I've visited this man in the uh, nursing home that I, well, you know, Pat Pickett's husband, Hubert, and Hubert and I fished together, you know, a little bit over the years and toward the last several years of his life, he came to church here and then, you know, Pat went home to be with the Lord then he ended up in a, in a nursing home, nice one. And I'd go visit him from time. And every time I'd go to see him, he'd go, there's this neuropathy, this neuropathy. This, they just, if I could just get rid of this neuropathy. So that, that's a serious thing. And thank God for healing. Amen. Yes. Amen. 
Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 22 tonight. Praise God. Matthew 22, we're going to begin in verse number 35. Matthew 22, verse 35 through 40. It says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, that's Jesus, testing him and saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Praise God. Brother Copeland said that he had this little mini vision. And he said in this little M-I-N-I, mini vision, when he had this little mini vision, the Lord flashed this scene before his eyes. And he said a man was trying to hang curtains. But he was having a horrible time hanging these curtains. He just couldn't get them to stay up there because really there was, there was no curtain rod. And so he'd pick up a, a curtain and it was named Healing and he'd work on it and work on it, but then it'd just fall to the ground. He'd pick up one on, say, Righteousness and he'd work on it and work on it, but it'd just kind of fall to the ground. He'd pick up one on, on finances, you know, and God meeting your needs and work on it and just kind of fall to the ground. He'd pick up one on, on faithfulness and just kind of fall to the ground. And he said all these curtains were just laying everywhere and he's running around frantically. And he said it was, it was really kind of, kind of comical looking. He said, but then it wasn't comical because all of a sudden he heard the man cry out and say, Lord God, I don't understand. I believe in abundance, but I'm behind in my bills. I can't pay my bills. And Lord, I believe in healing, but I'm sick and so forth. I'm serving you, Lord. I'm serving you. But, but, but uh, why are all these bad things happen to me? And then Brother Copeland said, I noticed over in the corner, here was this, here was this beautiful, obviously very strong and, and massive and stout curtain rod, this great big giant golden curtain rod. And on it was written in huge letters, Matthew 22, 37 and 40. I mean, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the Lord said, you got to hang the rod first. You got to hang the rod. The curtains are on the rod. Hang the rod. And then, then all, and then, and the, because they all hang on the law of love. And then Brother Copeland said, you know, he said, there are two things every believer must clearly establish in their thinking. Number one is everything works by spiritual law. Everything works by spiritual law. Well, faith is a spiritual law. You work the law of faith and, and it produces for you. Seed time and harvest, that is a natural law. That is a spiritual law. When you sow, you reap. It's a spiritual law. Law means it works every single time. It's a spiritual law or principle. And there are all kinds of principles. So things just don't happen, you know, just for the heck of it. No, somebody is working spiritual laws. And so he said, every believer must be established and realize that everything works by spiritual law. And number two, no law of God, no principle of God, no law of God works correctly unless it's first tied to the law of love. The law of love. So operating in spiritual laws of faith, seed time and harvest, humility, that's a spiritual law. Faithfulness is a spiritual law. Uh, there's all kind of principles and laws that govern prayers. Prayers just don't work because God likes somebody better than another person. If a prayer works, it's because somebody's operating according to the spiritual laws that govern that particular prayer. And so if, when people are operating according to those spiritual laws of prayer, they work. Spiritual laws of diligence versus laziness. Spiritual laws of servanthood. And there's all kinds of them. All of those things will produce wonderful things in our life. But they are all tied, first of all, to love for God and love for one another. In other words, all these things won't really work right unless you get those two things straight. That's the rod. When you get the rod up there, then you can connect to it. Glory to God. That's love for God and love for others. And so we have to get that right first. Can you say amen? amen. Now, 1 Peter 4, 8 says this. It says, above all things, have fervent love for one another. Not just love, but fervent love. Amen. Intense love, passionate love. Above all things, have intense, passionate, fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Amen. Well, we just read where Jesus said, you know, he, Peter said, above all things, Jesus said, first of all, you know, first love God. This is the most important thing you should do. And then he said, the second is like unto that, and that's love one another. Amen. Glory to God. For, you know, uh, love is the commandment of the new covenant. 
That is the commandment. If you walk in love, you know, Romans says you fulfill all the law. Amen. Because if I love you, I won't, I won't do anything to hurt you. Glory to God. And then 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, And now abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. The first commandment is to love one another. Above all things, Peter said, have fervent love for one another. And the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3, 14, Above all these things, put on love. Amen. So every Christian, every Christian should major on walking in love. Every Christian should be serious about walking in love. Every Christian should work at it. How are you going to do that? You're going to renew your minds to what the Word of God says agape love is, God's love is. You're going to renew your minds to that, and then, you go, then you're going to go out and practice it in everyday life. I don't know, somehow there's a, there's a disconnect between teaching on love and walking in love somehow, sometimes. Amen? I, I don't know what the right word is. Some, sometimes there's too much of, a, of an academic approach or too much of an analytical approach uh, that doesn't just transfer out into everyday reality. You know, somebody said the love talk is a whole lot easier than the love walk. <laughs> Amen. And so, so we, you know, it, it's all about others. It's all about how we treat others in love. It's all about how we care for others and do for others and serve others. And it's all about how we respond to the ways that people treat us. That's everyday reality, see, and that's what walking in love is all about. Glory to God. So Peter said, Peter said, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. See others, it will cover their sins. Now that is a quote from Proverbs chapter 20, love will cover a multitude of sins. That's a quote from Proverbs 10, 12 that says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Well, if we want to properly interpret that, you know, uh, we have to understand the way the book of Proverbs was written. Sometimes it's a contrast. The first line contrasts the second one. Sometimes the second line says the exact same thing the first line does, just in a different way. And so, he, so he's talking about hatred versus hatred stirs up strife. And the opposite of that is love covers all sins. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers, you know, Peter says love covers a multitude of sins, Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, covers a transgression. But he who repeats a matter separates friends. So we, we start to see this is not just an isolated thought. And in a minute, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter. And 1 Corinthians 13 deals with this. It's kind of overlooked sometimes, and, and not, people don't realize what, what it says. But when 1 Corinthians says love bears all things, literally that's love covers all things, literally, literally. And so, so this, is, this is a major theme, and, and, and so we're going to see that, uh, it was this idea that, that love covers a multitude of sins. Notice again, Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. I don't know about you, but when I think about hatred, I think about somebody just, just absolutely loathing somebody. You know, we, we, you, know you, you think of people say, I hate their guts. I know that's a harsh language, but you get what I'm talking about. You know, that's, you know, but, 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 and people don't realize that you don't have to hate somebody's guts to be walking in hate. If you're bitter in your heart toward them, you're walking in the realm of hate. If you rejoice in the fact that something bad happens to them, you're walking in the realm of hate. See, hate is not just, not just, I want them to die, their three kids, their wife, their two dogs, and I hope somebody burns their house down. No, you don't have to have that kind of feeling towards somebody. You can just not like them and, you know, be against them, so to speak. And that's the, that is hate. See, hatred is not just intense, passionate dislike. Hatred also means, and this is the way it's used in the book of Hebrews, it means ill will towards someone. Bad feelings. You just have bad feelings toward them. Hard feelings, we say, you know, in, our, in America. Hard feelings. Just, just feel hard at them. You don't feel bad toward them. Uh, you, you want to see harm come to them. You, you dream about, you know, you wouldn't do it, but you dream about, uh, you, you know, something bad happening to them. Now, come on. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You, you deal with the same devil in the same flesh I do. <laughs> 
But if you want something bad to happen to them and you have hard feelings to them, that is operating in the realm of hate. So in context here and elsewhere, someone who has ill will or bad feelings toward another person, what, what, do you, what these scriptures say, that, that, that person will expose the other person's faults and failures and sins if they get a chance. Did you hear what so-and-so did? I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew it. And so they'll, they'll talk about it. They will gossip about them and, and they'll, they'll spread around everything they know about them that's wrong or, or, you know, in order to get back at them and to hurt them in some way, usually because they feel like this person has done them wrong in some way. And that causes strife and disunity and harm as a, and, and separation. See, separate friends. That causes separation. That causes disunity. That causes harm. Sometimes people think, well, I, I don't hate them. But again, they, they, they just have these hard feelings toward them. That, that, that's, that's malice. If you want something bad to happen to somebody, that's malevolent. That's an ugly word, you know. And ill will and hard feelings toward others is the root reason many times to why somebody won't let love cover a multitude of sins. Ah, you know, they'll even stand, you know, supposedly behind scriptures and say, you know, these things have to be exposed in the body of Christ. And we must cut out this cancer from the body of Christ. And we've got to deal with this. And there is a place for that, but, but there's also a place for this. Amen. Now let's look at, I'll say some more about that, so hang on. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's look at that. Turn there with whatever you look at. I was watching that movie. If you hadn't seen this, you've you got to watch this movie, Church People. Have anybody seen Church People? I think it's on, what, what's it on, Amazon? Church People is done by Church People, and it is funny. It's kind of making fun of us, but it has a good point to it. And it's, it's called Church People. I want you to see it. You'll, you'll like it. And the, the youth pastor, he says, everybody turn in their phones. You know, so. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or not turn, but look at your phone. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, the great love chapter. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. He could say in love before everything, but you could say lo love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, and love never fails. These four verses are extremely well known. Amen. Anybody ever have to memorize those verses? Anybody ever memorize them on purpose? You know, these, these are wonderful verses. They are, they are often quoted. They're often taught on. But verse, verses six, it's just four verses. Two out of these four verses are kind of slighted. Nobody much teaches on verses six and seven. Amen. That they're kind of overlooked. Even commentaries. I mean, when you look in commentaries, not much is said about them, especially when you compare to what's said about verses four and five. And I think that part of the problem, yeah, yeah, but you know, there's, there's some powerful, powerful, important truths found here. But part of the problem is people just don't really understand and see what these verses are saying. You know, because it's a, it's a little poetic and you have to take it in context and you have to, you know, kind of look at all of it together, not just line by line. So it's a little difficult to teach on that way. But let's study this out because it's very important. Chapter 13, 6 does not rejoice in iniquity. First of all, understand something that really opens up this passage to you, especially these last two verses. This whole passage is talking about how love deals with people how love responds to people, how love acts toward other people. Love suffers long with others. Love suffers long with other people. Love doesn't behave rudely toward others. It's all about what you do. Love takes into account, it says, you know, King James or New King James, it says, uh, thinks no evil, literally takes no account of the evil done to it. So love doesn't take into account the evil done to it by others. It's all about others and how you respond to others and how you treat others. Amen. And so in verse number six, what he's saying is love, understood subject of the sentence here, love does not rejoice in iniquity. Well, obviously love doesn't rejoice. It's not glad about sin. It's not glad about evil and it's not glad about wickedness. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying here, love doesn't rejoice in the sins and shortcomings and failures and faults of others. And that's very clear as you put verses six and seven all together. 
Love does not rejoice, amen, in the sins and shortcomings of others. It takes no pleasure, takes no joy, glory to God, in hearing that some believer sinned and messed up. Did you hear what happened to so and so? I tell you, I, I, just, I, I avoid that stuff, you know, and then my, my ears really pick up if, if so and so is somebody that, that, that I don't like <laughs> in the natural. <laughs> But you, but you can't believe that stuff. But anyway, it takes no pleasure or joy hearing that some believer sinned and messed up. But love is glad. It rejoices when others are walking in the truth. And that is the exact idea in the original Greek is that you don't rejoice because uh, bad was revealed about somebody, because you heard somebody sin, because you heard somebody messed up, or you don't rejoice because they're suffering hardship or trouble, or problems due to their sin and due to their failure. No love rejoices with people who are blessed because they're walking in the truth. Hallelujah. It, it's the flesh that rejoices over other people's failures and troubles, especially if they view that person as someone who has wronged and mistreated them. You know, a real test of a believer's maturity and spirituality is to check and see how you react to someone else's victory and blessings and to check and see how you react to someone else's failure. We ought to rejoice with those that are blessed and be happy, not jealous and envious. Amen. And it ought to break our heart when somebody fails. Doesn't mean there's not a place for church discipline and correction and in any act of life as a parent, as a, you know, as a boss or whatever, because there is. But we should be glad when others are blessed and sad if they failed. But sadly, many do, do just the opposite. Love is not glad when people fail. Amen. Love knows if they don't repent, that they're headed for trouble. Glory to God. And love wants to see them restored. Love wants to see them walking in, in the light. Love wants to see them walking in truth, praise God. But, but you know, too much of the time when something bad happens to somebody else and it's revealed that they messed up in some kind of way or, or they, you know, committed some sin and it's exposed and everybody knows about it. You know, a lot of times you hear even Christians say, I just serves them right. I'm glad they're finally getting theirs. It's about time they got theirs. They, they deserve what they're getting. But if we're thinking that and saying that, then we are operating in hate, you see, and that causes division and strife and disunity and trouble. But love covers a multitude of sins. Now here, here's from a commentary. I think this is the Barnes commentary. Listen to this. His commentary on rejoices not in iniquity, King James. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Does not rejoice over the vices of other people. Does not take delight when they are guilty of crime or when in any manner they fall into sin. It does not find pleasure in hearing others accused of sin and having it proved that they committed it. It does not find a malicious pleasure in the report that they have done wrong or in following up that report and finding it established. Amen. I mean, sometimes you hear things about people just absolutely not the truth. What a cruel and horrible thing to believe something about somebody that's not true. But even if it is true. Amen. Wicked people often find pleasure in this and rejoice when others have fallen into sin and have disgraced and ruined themselves. People of the world often find a malignant pleasure in the report and then the evidence that a member of the church has brought dishonor on his profession. A man often rejoices when an enemy, a persecutor, or a slander has committed some crime, and when he has shown an improper spirit, uttered a rash expression, or taken some step which will involve him in, in uh, infamy. But love does none of these things. It does not desire that an enemy, a persecutor, a slanderer, should do evil or should disgrace and ruin himself. It does not rejoice, but grieves when a professor of religion, or an enemy of religion, when a personal friend or foe has done anything wrong. It neither loves the wrong nor the fact that it has been done. And perhaps there is no greater triumph of the gospel than, it, than its enabling a man to rejoice that even his enemy and persecutor in any respect does well. Or to rejoice that he in any way honored and respected, uh, that he is honored and respected among people. Human nature without the gospel manifests a different spirit. And it's only as the heart is subdued by the gospel and filled with universal benevolence that it is brought to rejoice when all people do well. One man said, the world seems to take delight in the downfall of others, 
yet love grieves and blushes at another's immorality. So with all that in mind, you know, with that background, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, Rejoice is not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Listen to these different translations of that. The complete Jewish Bible says, Love does not gloat over other people's sins. So you can read that all your life and not catch what's being said. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Love does not gloat over other people's sins. The easy to read Bible says, Love is never happy when others do wrong. The message says, Love doesn't revel when others grovel. Doesn't revel when others grovel. The Hayford translation says, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, finding satisfaction in the shortcomings of others and in spreading an evil report. I want to read that again. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, finding satisfaction in the shortcomings of others and in spreading an evil report. Some people rejoice twice over another person's sin. First when they hear about it, and they rejoice the second time when they tell others about it. <laughs> but these things should not be so, not among us. The Jerusalem Bible says, Love takes no pleasure in people's sins. Well, that flows right into verse number 7, because verse number 7 goes on to say, Bears all things. Again, that's very unclear to us. That's blind to us. It bears all things. Keep in mind that the love passage, this passage, has already dealt with bearing with or being patient with other people. You know, if you bear with somebody, you're having to put up with something. You're having to put up with somebody that's just, just slow to get it. You're having to put up with somebody that's aggravating. You have to put up with something that's, that's, that's not good, you know. But the first Corinthians has already dealt with that. Paul's already dealt with that. So he's not saying the same thing again. He's not saying bear with them as in put up or be patient with them or, or suffer long with them. The word bear here in the Greek literally means to protect by covering. Like a roof over a house. See, it protects what's in the house from being damaged. It's a covering, a covering. Amen. And, and, and remember, Proverbs and Peter said, love covers a multitude of sins. That's God through Proverbs and through Peter. Strong's recorded says, figuratively, this, this means to cover with silence. Amen. You're going to protect them with silence. In other words, you're not going to repeat the bad thing you heard about them. You're not going to talk against them. You're not going to spread it around. You're not going to gossip about them. You're not going to repeat the matter over and over again. But you're going to let love cover. You're going to be silent about it and let love <coughs> cover a multitude of sins. Now we understand and realize, and so does the Bible, so does Paul, that love doesn't condone sin. That's not what he's talking about here. Love doesn't ignore sin. Love doesn't ignore wrongdoing. But in context, this is saying love is not out to expose people and to embarrass people. Would you bring me that water, Margie? <coughs> love is not out to embarrass people and expose people and make it hard for them to live and make it hard for them to have a job. Amen. You know, you know in Galatians it says, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one that has fallen into sin. Brother Hagin said, I realized one time I belonged to a denomination that wasn't one spiritual among us. Because if one of our preachers failed, all they wanted to do was expose him, run him out of town, and never let him preach again. But the Word of God says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Somebody says, what if they won't be restored? Well, that's a different matter. And, and actually, 1 Corinthians here is going to talk about that in just a minute. And I realize action has to be taken sometime. But you know, oftentimes, that, that's, you know, sometimes people are talking about somebody and spreading evil reports about somebody. I know a situation where people were greatly damaging a man's reputation. The man, a sinister, had fallen. He had sinned. He had done some wrong things. He had uh, repented. He had put himself before a board of elders, a legitimate board of elders. He had set out of the ministry for a year. He had done everything they told him to do. And this was two and three years later, and people are talking about it. That man's forgiven, and these people that are talking about him, they're the ones in sin, not the man that had fallen. I got all excited and started to throw that at you, but I thought better of it. <laughs> <I appreciate that. laughs> not that I don't doubt your athletic prowess. But. <laughs> so love doesn't ignore sin. We understand that. It doesn't condone sin. But in context, again, this love is not out to expose people. 
and embarrass people. It wants to protect them. It wants to forgive them. It wants to see them restored. So it overlooks their faults, their failures, their shortcomings, their sins, and it doesn't spread their sin around with words. Now again, to make sure you understand where I'm coming from, if people, if a person refuses to repent and openly practices some sin and doesn't want help and won't admit they're wrong, that's vastly different from somebody that loves the Lord with all their heart and they're very sincere, sincere and maybe they fall over and 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 over again, but nonetheless, they know it's wrong and they won't help and they're trying to get up. That's vastly different. But you know, you do run into people from time to time that they won't even admit they're wrong, they won't acknowledge their sin and they refuse to repent. That's a different subject altogether. And so in those cases, some you know, uh, spiritual discipline, church discipline uh, and correction uh, uh, you know, is to be done. Parents have to correct, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but even the purpose of spiritual discipline, church discipline, is to bring people back to God and to restoration, not to destroy them. You remember that scripture says, don't, don't treat him like an enemy, but as a brother. Paul said to turn him over to the flesh. You know, but then when the man repented and restored, he said, hey, you know, welcome him back into your fellow. Love him, forgive him, welcome him back. Glory to God. Rick Renner said this could be translated, you know, love bears all things, bears all things. This could be translated, love protects, shields, guards, covers, conceals, and safeguards people from exposure. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. We don't have time to, to go into it, to it, you know, you know, in great detail, but to finish out six and seven, let, let's look at this. Love does not rejoice. Love doesn't rejoice over other people's failures. It doesn't rejoice over other people's sins. It overlooks and over covers their sins and their mistakes and forgives them. And then it says, believes all things. Well, you probably know because it's been made famous from the Amplified Bible, Amplified Classic, believes the best of others. See, it's all about others. Believes all things. Well, I'm not talking about just believes all things. Believes the best of others. Talking about others. You believe the best of others. You hear a bad report and you say, well, I, you know, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't you want people to give you the benefit of the doubt? Well, how many of you know you sow judgment, you're going to reap judgment. If you sow mercy, you're going to reap mercy. And what you sow, you're going to reap. So I just choose to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, but you know what they said about you? Well, I don't know what context they said it in. I don't know what light they said it in. And, you know, have you ever said something you didn't really mean? Or said it in a wrong way? I just choose to give the, I want people to give me the benefit of the doubt, so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Because that's what love would do. So, 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 so this is saying love doesn't, watch this as beautifully as it flows together. Love, love doesn't rejoice over other people's sins and failures and faults. It's glad when people are walking in the truth and are blessed. And it overlooks and covers other people's sins. And it believes the best of others. Amen. Amplified said that. Another translation says it's ever ready to believe the best. Some people are ready to believe the worst. Ready to believe the best of others. And even when it can't believe, because sometimes you can't. Sometimes, sometimes it happens, something happened, it was horrible, it was exposed, it was wrong, and, and it's true. It's absolutely, they say it's true. Well, you still hope all things. What is hope? A confident day. You have a, and maybe they sin, maybe they fail, and they don't even care that they sin and they fail, and they're proud of the fact that they sinned and they failed, but you still hope. Got any way with children? You still, you have a confident expectation and you hope and you endure. Love endures. We're talking about you're enduring somebody in this context that has sinned, that has fallen, that has fell, and, and they're, they're, not, they're not even seemingly trying to get help, but you're not going to give up on them. You're not going to quit on them. You may have to do what you have to do. There may have to be some separation. There may have to be some correction, but you love them. You care about them. You're concerned about them. You still hope for the best for them. And you're willing to put up with a lot from them. Now, you don't let them come in and steal everything. You don't understand that. But, but you, en you endure their wrong behavior for love's sake because you're holding on to the fact that nothing is hopeless. They could still turn back to God. Hallelujah. 
So it believes all things. Better it's always ready to believe the best of others. And even when it can't believe the best, it hope. It has a confident expectation of them repenting and overcoming their sin. It doesn't consider that person hopeless. And for love's sakes, you'll endure a lot of them. You refuse to give up on them, even though they're wrong. So Barclay's translation says, love's first instinct is to believe in people. You understand the, these, these translations from these Greek scholars are not just pulling this out of the hat. This is based on what the scripture is saying. Love's first instinct is to believe in people. Barclay says, love is slow to expose and always eager to believe the best. Hayford translation says, love believes the best of others, credits them with good intentions and is not suspicion. And then in essence, when you, when you have in fact messed up and it's true love hopes all things never giving up on the person glory to God I remember going all the way back to 1977 and I wasn't even talking about 6 and 7 I was just talking about verses 4, four and 5 you know King James Bible says love suffereth long you know and it's got all that kind of stuff and I was at a Methodist uh, uh, Prayer group, and I mean, this is this is more people that's in this room tonight. Big group of ladies, and I and I taught on this. And this this little lady came up to me, you know, she seemed like she was eighty years old. Of course, I was only like twenty three. She was probably fifty, but she seemed like she was like eighty years old. <laughs> and she said, she said, I want you to know, I have always, I know it's the Bible, but I've always just disliked that love suffereth long and. You know, it's vaunteth not itself. and because I, she, said, she said, I was made to memorize that as a little girl, you know, just a little eight-year-old girl. And she said, I had no idea what it means. And I just always didn't even like this passage. But she said, as you begin to explain it tonight and, and read it from like the Amplified Bible and so forth, she said, I begin to see this is one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love's not out to get people, it's out to help people. It wants to believe the best in them. It wants to be happy that they rejoice. It's, it's not happy when they failed, even if they're my enemy. And they're out to get me, and they're spreading lies. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not happy that they're, that they're living that way. Really, they're in trouble. Amen? And so love, Hayford believes the best of others, credits them with good intentions, is not suspicious, and love hopes all things. Never giving up on people. Glory to God. Amen. Now, all of this is just my introduction. Put back the, the title up there. <laughs> what I want to get to is practicing love in everyday life. Six keys. Somebody says, oh my God, you're not going to teach them those six keys tonight. No, we're not, we're not going to. <laughs> we're not even going to get to, to even point one of that. But I want to talk about practicing love in everyday life, or really six keys to practicing love in everyday life. But first and foremost, let's make a commitment to walk in love. I know that most of you have already done that. But you know, you can renew commitments. And it's been a subject that, is, that has been extremely important to me, and it's going to stay important to me that we walk in love. Praise God. But because without love, these other spiritual principles won't work. And without those spiritual principles working, then there is no victory. But I want to walk in love because God loves me. Amen. And because when I fall, He loves me. Glory to God. Aren't you glad your sins aren't exposed before the whole world? Aren't you glad everybody can't read your every thought? Not that they're all, you know, sometimes they're demonic thoughts. They're not your thoughts, but nonetheless, aren't you glad? Praise God. And so, so first and foremost, let's commit to walk in love. And, and let's remember that it's all, it's all about others. And a part of walking in love is that love covers a multitude of sins. No sense getting all goofy about that and goofed up. Well, I mean, you know, we have to expose sin and deal with sin and condemn sin. Yeah, we, we do. But when somebody's repentant and somebody loves God and somebody's sincere, you know, just because they sin big time, messed up big time. I mean, you know, we celebrate David and, and you know all of that. Noah, Noah got drunk. David, David had a man killed. So he could sleep with his wife. Can you imagine that happening at first church here in Cleveland or second church or third church? We wouldn't be celebrating David too much, would we? 
But thank God he's a, he's a God of a first chance, a God of a second chance, a God of a third chance, and a God of a billion chances. That's how great his love is for us. Not that we should take sin lightly, but, but thank God he forgives us. Aren't you glad he forgave you? Praise God. Let's stand together. Praise God. I have to start, stop here. I either teach on those six keys. So, you know, it's... <laughs> Everybody say it out loud. Say, love, love. Covers, a of sins. covers a multitude of sins. Amen. Love is silent. Amen. About a multitude of sins. Somebody else's sin. His first instinct is to believe in others. Or as the Amplified Classic says, believes the best of others, not the worst. You want people to believe the best of you, then you believe the best of them. See, that's one of those things. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do, you. do you want people to give you the benefit of the doubt? Then you give them the benefit of the doubt. Do you want people to automatically just believe every little rumor or bad thing they hear about you? Then don't you believe every little thing? Matter of fact, the Bible says, I've had several people challenge me on this, and I say, oh, sure, I'll give you the scriptures. They're right beside each other, within three verses of each other. But in Proverbs, it said, if you only hear one side of the story, you're a fool to answer a matter if you hear one side of the story and, and, and try to answer it without hearing the other side. And then a, few, then a few verses later it says, everybody sounds good, I'm paraphrasing, but it says, everybody sounds good in court until you hear the other side. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's biblical wisdom. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. We're so delighted and glad that you came tonight. Did you get anything out of that? Yes. Amen. We're gonna, we'll dismiss and we'll start prayer here in about 10 or 12 minutes. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us online. We love you.